It's raining in Stranglethorn, but the drooping leaves of the palms and ferns are still. Things don't change here. Only the ship comes and goes, gliding without a wave. It's the perfect day for a burial. For many players, World of Warcraft is a fling. For others, World of Warcraft is a lifestyle, like One Piece, Nintendo, or fighting games. But for a few people, specifically among those who played it young, World of Warcraft is formative. But I'm not here to extol the virtues of this. I'm hesitating to call it a game. At some point, I got it into my head to make a World of Warcraft video, but I don't recommend World of Warcraft. It's one of my favorite experiences ever, core to my being. Can't recommend it. So why do this? The short answer is that this game is the most important video game experience of all 31 years of my life. I'm sick with World of Warcraft. It's been festering, and it needs to be excised. The game's old. Ancient, even. Either you've played it, know someone who played it, or watched something about it. It's a veritable gaming illness. A dangerous word to sling. Illness, but accurate nonetheless. Almost every friend that I knew growing up played World of Warcraft. It was a lure like no other. The ultimate PC gamer bait. Home to overworked office schlubs, stay-at-home mothers who call you Han, and dirtbag kids. It rippled through the world, infecting entire friend groups, leaping over Halo and toppling Smash. Its name spun into myth in a few short years. The game South Park covered the game that killed people. And if it wasn't my own friends playing, it was their older brothers and their friends. To call World of Warcraft popular is insulting. World of Warcraft is was a shift of tectonic proportions. Blizzard Entertainment released the game in November 2004 when I was 12 years old, too busy with Final Fantasy Tactics Advance and Golden Sun, and I wouldn't play the game until I was 13 going on 14 in 2006, my final year of elementary school, a single year shy of World of Warcraft's very first expansion, The Burning Crusade. Anyway. Players forget to go back into the past. A friend of mine was getting into WoW and wanted more people to play with. He created a Night Elf Druid and told me about it. I had no idea what a Night Elf was, and I was pretty sure from my time playing Golden Sun that a Druid could do something with plants. And that sounded really cool. He explained to my brother and I that World of Warcraft was an MMORPG, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, and that we could play online with him, and the only catch was a monthly fee. There were no games with monthly fees, not to my 12-year-old knowledge. Wrong as it was, that honor goes to the 3DO's Meridian 59, and only if we're going by online MMOs with subscription fees. But the concept was at once ridiculous and enticing. Paying to play had to be open and obvious manipulation from a company, like borderline illegal. It couldn't be that good. I had a GameCube with Soul Calibur 2 and Resident Evil 4. You literally needed to purchase physical time cards in store. That is, if you were 14 and didn't have a credit card. So WoW had to be something surreal. My brother and I, and my other brother, where triplets don't ask, delivered flyers locally and did so for years preceding this World of Warcraft. But there was a monolithic problem. My mother. She was always fairly tough, strict, didn't give in to petty requests or whining, and I was terrified she would hear about this monthly fee and scoff, or veto the decision citing the wasted money. Even my 14-year-old brain knew that a monthly fee was something adults dealt with, not children. But my brother and I, and not my other brother don't ask, asked my mother if we could purchase this game, a game that came on four whole discs and sucked up everything our old IBM family computer had, then pay the monthly fee to enter the World of Warcraft. She shrugged after hearing our pitch and said, sure, like it was nothing. It was our money and we worked for it so we could do what we liked. I fear that this moment irreparably changed the course of my life in ways my mother couldn't possibly know, but at that very instant, she was angelic. I think in all my years leading up to that point between doing music lessons 
and scouts or boy scouts as americans call them drama camp between delivering flyers and going to school that single question and installing world of warcraft thanks to money i made was my first true act of autonomy genuinely i didn't exercise myself much at all i was annoying like any 14 year old but i largely did what was expected of me and otherwise sat playing video games custom robo on the gamecube and pokemon sapphire unlike those games wow was something i pushed for it sounds dramatic but in scale and scope how few risks i took it was a battle won my first in the world of warcraft the taste of victory did not last we toiled for hours downloading each of the four discs contents onto the computer waiting 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 on dial-up internet by the way so let's acknowledge and preserve that experience and when it finally downloaded and the time card was successfully activated and our first character's final details were lovingly set in waxy polygons we entered the game technically sharing an account and therefore breaking terms of service immediately and got maybe six fps out of the game a jittery unplayable mess world of warcraft is a piece of mechanical wizardry it was ungodly huge and absurdly complex but it was built to run on all kinds of computers because most computers in most homes were trash and mine the home computer of two teachers who mainly relied on photocopies of an education empire long since built could not withstand the girth of the world of warcraft seeing our crushed expressions my stepfather went out that night or the day after i can't remember and purchased some additional ram for the computer when it was installed we could finally play and at a fairly stable frame rate they say you remember people for the way they make you feel and I will simply never forget that kindness. Thanks, man. Now, here, I have to stop the video and issue a warning. This isn't how I usually write videos or make videos. This isn't a review of World of Warcraft. Instead, it's a journal or reflection of my time playing something that was important to me with a focus on the original version of the game, Vanilla WoW. And frankly, I didn't play the game correctly until something like 2015 or ever arguably this is going to get weird and kind of uncomfortable this isn't for anyone this will be my ugliest video but i have to let it out so character creation is a big deal in world of warcraft in mmos writ large and especially in those days you couldn't just go to the barber and get a whole face grafted on you were stuck with your choices they added a paid character change at some point but i didn't own a credit card so for me and many other younger players that first character was an expression you're a person sitting behind a screen and you're going to stare at a digital person's backside for truly unholy hour counts you need to make that backside count but contrary to that much touted piece of common wisdom from guys who just want to stare at a virtual girl's ass one must also crop one's face to be suitably terrifying on the battlefield my brother wanting a cool character i guess picked a tauren hunter the warcraft minotaur race known for their nomadic earth reverent ways i picked a human warlock with the single coolest haircut that i would later come to have in real life almost gold eyes white hair and weathered an old man Nobody asked why I was playing an old man. In other games, I usually picked young swordsmen. Marth in Melee, Yun Sung in Soul Calibur 2, or Pretty Boys otherwise. Xion in Bloody Roar Primal Fury. We don't often question our avatar choices, and why would we when the reasons are so personal? The truth is, I was having a tough year in school and lost my gaming privileges more than once, which led me to pick up books the original Game Boy. I was in the thick of the Dragonlance trilogy, probably somewhere inconvenient for YouTube advertisers like the time Tannis Half-Elven has steamy s***. I was a broody, mopey teenager, and I loved Raistlin Majer. I wanted to be Raistlin Majer, because Raistlin Majer was an asshole, A snarky, miserable, cynical, overly powerful mage hobbled only by his horrendous constitution. He's not even old. He just looks that way because well, it's a contextual thing, but setting aside that there were no pretty boys in 
World of Warcraft until the Blood Elves in the Burning Crusade is seriously, even Night Elves were fairly stony, all things considered. Setting aside that every character was a series of boxes, setting aside that the Horde was smelly. My brother was part of the Horde, and when you're a triplet, forever number one, two, or three, identity is everything. Everyone else was playing a Night Elf, gnomes were embarrassing, and dwarves were basically a race of people cursed with the lived reality of the 4x3 aspect ratio stretched to widescreen. I saw my opportunity and took it. Oh, and I picked the Warlock class because I read online that it could summon demons and ride a fire horse. The real Wraithlin would have been a mage. Mild oversight. Infinitely cooler. I mean, I'm sorry. Frostbolt, summon a demon. It's like one plus one, man. Character creation is important. It's not a high stakes exercise until you hit OK, and you can always start another character. We're not playing the dungeons or the dragons, but it grounds you in the world, in the multiplayer experience. It's what other people see you as, physically, in the great tap dancing identity compromise we're all made to join. My brother and I looked nothing like our real selves, but we were off to have our adventures an hour or two at a time. There was only one computer and we had to share. But adventures, nonetheless. In many ways, this retelling feels alien. I've played WoW for a long time. I've been off it for a long time, but for most of that time, I was a member of the Horde. Still, my foundational experience was with the Alliance. It seems so obvious to pick the Alliance. They were the good guys, human beings, the Gimli and Legolas races, this species of garden squatter. The Horde by contrast, was Ooga Booga type shit. They all surely stank, and worse, two of four Horde races started in the single orangest place I've ever seen in a video game. Doratar is oranger than Mars. Doratar physically hurts to look at. Doratar is someone's creative decision. In a couple years after WoW, I would gain an appreciation for the Horde, even Doratar through my time in Warcraft 3, but until then, the Alliance was my team. Working through the starting area, that sun-dappled cloister, flinging shadow bolts at everything I could until I finally collected enough experience to leave those alabaster gates tanned by the setting sun, I, at last, entered Elven Forest. One thing you'll realize if you've never played WoW is that WoW is enormous. Maybe nowadays its actual size is dwarfed by your Skyrims and your whatever else is, but the game was huge. Too huge to comprehend meaningfully, at least for someone who'd never seen an MMO. People talked about Ultima Online and EverQuest, but I was slightly too young for them, and frankly, EverQuest looked hideous. WoW was cartoony, almost cutting edge for fantasy, except for all the reused trope dressing, but you gotta remember that old era fantasy, like the type my parents would have known, looked like this. And to a kid, that's just... Like, what are we even doing here? I know people who don't dig WoW's aesthetic, but it was at least kind of subversive, cartoony and interesting, a series with action flick and even anime blood skirting the line between old and new so finely. Look at Illidan's Storm Rage. This is the coolest character ever made, cause buddy, it's that or the hottest. Elwyn Forest was vast and beautiful. One could expend the barest effort to imagine succulent, ripe apples blooming from trees, bees buzzing, and flowers lining the fields. I spent hours in this zone exploring every grassy hill, every murloc-infested pond, every cobalt-ridden mine. I remember the pastoral grandeur of the logging camp, the intrigue of the Dark Moon Fair. I got my character drunk at 14 years old with no reference for what that really meant. I remember the Goldshire Inn. But since it was a small server, it wasn't half as enjoyable. I talked to the NPCs, I leveled my warlock spells in the dingy cellar, I met the blacksmith. Why would you ever meet a video game blacksmith? It's incredible how much time you can take completing a task when you're savoring it. I wanted to hit the level cap. I saw the level 60 players riding through the zone, but I wasn't rushing to be them because, for all I knew, my brother would stop and I'd have to quit. But more than that, I was enjoying the exploration. I mean, 
really enjoying a fictional world. If you've ever watched my show, you know I don't really give a shit about that kind of thing. Not about exploring nooks or crannies, and certainly not side quests. This is the one time in my life, and never thereafter, that I fully appreciated a game and its world completely immersed. Because the fiction of World of Warcraft, the empaldroned hero of the Alliance with an enormous sword, that felt attainable, real. But to become that person, I had to master the world of Warcraft. Part of that was mastering my class. Warlocks were a pet class, and through a short quest line I acquired my first, an imp whose name I can't remember. You couldn't name your demons, that was something reserved for hunters. The imp is deceptively useful, but not in leveling. At least its running animation is kind of funny. I remember dueling other low-level players right here in Goldshire. In WoW, you can set up a duel with the slash duel command, an incredible feature, by the way, which, if accepted, puts you in direct conflict with the other player until one of you runs out of bounds for too long, or one player is reduced to one hit point. I laid into my opponent with my Immolation, Corruption, and Curse of Agony. Three damage over time spells, along with a hail of shadow bolts. And my pet imp, blasting his little firebolt until the enemy's health ticked down, and he died. He died right in the square. Players couldn't die in duels. Clearly, something glitched. I quickly typed, sorry, and ran. I left Goldshire and didn't look back. I was afraid that player would be angry at me. If you were killed by my low-level warlock in Goldshire in 2007, I'm sorry. I remember Hogger the Elite Knoll, now a long-standing meme in the community. A foe of epic proportions in such an inconsequential zone. A trend that continued in many zones because the developers knew that to care about a World of Warcraft was to witness, participate in, and mythologize about such a world, to build intrigue and relish the battles. I remember having to pay for spell ranks at Warlock Trainers, a particularly cruel feature for a child long since eliminated from the game, which sought to financially drain the careless player who spent their coppers on pet cats and alcohol and cool swords from the auction house. I remember the investiture, the weighty mantle of responsibility the game slowly lowered onto my unimpaltering shoulders. Me, the new player. It only made the rewards that much more satisfying. At level 10, after questing through all of Elwyn Forest, caring more about a game than I ever previously managed, I could finally take on the Warlock quest to acquire him, the Voidwalker. Possibly, scratch that, emphatically the coolest summonable pet in any video game. He could tank anything. He pulled dudes off my frail old avatar and roughed them up. My own goon. He made the game bearable. I was ready to take on the rest of the world of Warcraft. I was a clicker in those golden days. I didn't really care to learn hotkeys. I typed with two fingers like an idiot. I even do that today. I'm sorry, but you better believe I clicked my way through every murloc, every kobold, and every mangy animal that dared block my path. I like what clicking symbolizes. It's the true mark of a newcomer or someone not terribly interested in optimizing control of their character. A scrub, if you will. But scrubs can have adventures too. Backpedaling is another control quirk of newer players, those who haven't mastered holding mouse buttons, strafing, and jumping control options. I'm a mild input nerd, and I gotta tell you, WoW can be seriously complex to master for what appears to non-WoW players not super dissimilar to Knights of the Old Republic or Dragon Age, Bioware RPGs, that is. You ought to attack, but you've got to mind your inputs and positioning, especially in modes like PvP. Cue your abilities appropriately, mind your cooldowns. This isn't the video for a mechanical analysis, but I don't want to catch anyone calling WoW casual. WoW is f***ed up. WoW is untamable. By this point, you may have noticed the title of the video. As you might suspect, because you were previously told as much, this is not a complete take on World of Warcraft. Those takes exist. Why try? Instead, this is the tale of one very, very stupid child and the pirate level. His journey to reach the pirate level, and the soul exploring everything after. Also a few snippets on game design. A player leaving Elwyn Forest directly and not getting on the deep run tram to eventually enter Loch Madan or hitching a ride otherwise to Darkshore will eventually meet with two realistic choices. Westfall 
and the Red Ridge Mountains. I didn't care about the correct order of operations, I simply went to Red Ridge because my friend was there leveling his druid. There, by some means, whether questing or otherwise, I acquired a hideous white robe. I remember that robe and how much I hated it, but that I needed to wear the robe for the superior stats it granted my character. An avatar with the appearance of an old man walking around the world of Warcraft poorer than dirt and draped in a pathetic and degrading white robe. The innate badassery of the Voidwalker, my very warlock essence, withered away. Nowadays, this problem is solved with transmogrification. You can change the appearance of your gear on a whim. But in those days, WoW made a point to humble the player, humbled in breadth of the world, humbled in embarrassing mismatched clothing, humbled by the player wealth tax known as the skill system, humbled by your inability to play the party-based MMORPG like an action hero. It's no coincidence that the player, thusly humbled and now aware of elite monsters and other challenges beyond their solo means, learns of the orcish incursion north of Lakeshire. There, the Blackrock orcs spill into the zone, and they've taken a major stronghold to boot. It requires required teaming up with other players to kill them at all, but only ever temporarily. You're shown very early that the threat is real and the challenge insurmountable alone, and that effort, truly game-breaking effort, would be required to win this war. But it wasn't about winning the war, per se. We all wanted to have incredible avatars, heroes. World of Warcraft is a game about becoming a hero who must rely on others to survive and thrive in a brutal world. This powerful idea crystallized in my young mind. I despised the Horde. I wanted to destroy the Horde. I couldn't believe my own brother played Horde, that traitorous swine. But I was not fully ready for Red Ridge, too low leveled and stupid looking, so I left for Westfall. Westfall is the first barren zone a human player can enter. I mean, truly barren. While Loch Modan has green hills, verticality, funny stone homes, and Darkshore is kind of like the undead starting area at Tirisfall Glades, Westfall is a bona fide dust bowl, or even a dusty plain, much like that shelf you haven't cleaned in months. But Westfall is special because it holds one truly important landmark, Moonbrook. Not to be confused with the Kingdom of Moonbrook from Dragon Quest II. We might not be friends, but if you know of Moonbrook, either way, maybe we could try. Moonbrook was a slaughter. It's littered, riddled, infested with bandits of the Defias Brotherhood, a group teased from the beginning of the starting zone for human players. It contrasts directly with Red Ridge and its invading orcs, shows the player a threat from within other humans. Melee bandits, wizard bandits, stealth bandits, you will die at least once questing alone in Moonbrook. Oftentimes you'd be killing a wayward bandit, and the one that just spawned on top of it, and watch some hapless player run frantically out of the town because they accidentally aggroed more than a single bandit hiding behind a wagon, or a wall, or the one that spawned in and instantly smelled blood in the water. World of Warcraft is no longer in its vanilla state, and in fact, Classic WoW, touted by the company as the return to vanilla WoW, no longer exists in this form. Moonbrook and all of its spilled blood is officially lost to history, but it was magical. Under Moonbrook's blood-soaked soil, however, lay something far more historically resonant. Relevant? Resonant. It echoes through history. Under the depths of the town sat the lowest level alliance dungeon, the Deadmines. I won't recap every important or plot relevant boss in the Deadmines. In fact, I refuse to. And those memes and moments have nothing to do with my memory about it. I mean, sure, running through the labyrinthine mine, descending from the foundry to light the cannon down the way, and blowing open the door to an entire underground cavern containing a pirate ship? That's memorable. But it was my first true cooperative multiplayer experience. You might even say massively multiplayer online experience since I joined the World of Warcraft. People would call out in general chat LFG, DM, or VC, mines, or dead mines, asking for tanks, healers, and me, the lowly damage character. 
Everyone wants to deal damage, especially at 13. Healers were prized commodities, tanks were gods. The pecking order was established. My 13-year-old brain suddenly realized I was standing on a sort of endless staircase that stretched ever upward. Other staircases ran alongside mine, shinier, more ephemeral. I couldn't possibly tank. Warlocks couldn't really, not without some very particular, hyper-particular conditions met in certain expansions, and they could absolutely never heal. So I was stuck on the bronze rung from the very beginning. Like realizing you write about video games for a living, but have never attempted to make one. The horror. What stuck with me all these years is learning thoroughly in that moment that I was part of a group of players in these dungeons. They had the best loot and the toughest challenges before epic 40-man raids anyway, something I couldn't rightly imagine. So a standard of excellence was expected. Dungeons were serious business. Eventually, after pulling one too many mobs off of the tank with my Voidwalker, a monster that perpetually attempts to draw aggro towards it unless you toggle the ability off, I was told to summon my imp instead. I couldn't believe what I heard. The Voidwalker was my friend, and the imp was small and sh And I hadn't leveled up his abilities properly, but I did as I was told, granting my party the passive imp buff that raises each party member's stamina. I didn't like this arrangement, but I never made the same mistake twice. You have to make those little compromises in team games, or should, if you want to be invited to play again. But I was content in the end because it meant I was climbing that bronze ladder. My path was different, but it was visible. I stumbled many times climbing that ladder, always off to start another side character, a priest or a rogue, always having a romp through any given zone. I wanted the whole experience at once from the great wide world chalice. I was insatiable, but could only drink an hour at a time. I had several alts or tunes as players called them, small sordid affairs standing in direct contravention with the sacred vow I made to the character I chose to make my main. It might sound theatrical, but I assure you, this was no laughing matter. I barely got out of Goldshire with most of my alts, a human mage that never reached Stormwind, a human priest that never healed anybody, a rogue that I took all the way to Westfall, purely to acquire that prized Red Defias Brotherhood mask. That character looked indescribably cool, and probably cost me like 10 hours of playtime. Such was the pull of the World of Warcraft. If you wanted something, even something as rare in particular as gin rock or any katana, you could have it, but the price was always time or money. And as the goblins say, time is money, friend. None of my alts stand out to me in particular, aside from the rogue, but it was not uncommon for me, someone enraptured by the fantasy of the game, to create a character solely for the animations unique to that race or sex. Everyone knows Undead male warriors have sublimely understated two-handed sword-swinging animations. Everyone understands implicitly that the male dwarven casting animations are beauty incarnate, and especially uncontroversial. It is perfectly common knowledge that night elves occasionally performing a flip instead of a regular jump instantly elevates the race to the heights of selectable alliance character options. These small traits weren't undone by the developers, per se. Night Elves still have a chance today to flip every time a player hits the jump button, but after a certain expansion, unique animations were streamlined, presumably for something stuffy and boring, like visual clarity, instantly erasing a veritable library of Alexandria of personal motives for picking particular races. World of Warcraft never really captured that again. This isn't the story of how things changed across expansions. I don't have time to even begin to catalog the myriad ways Blizzard f their game up. But as we move to Duskwood, I feel compelled to mention Stitches, the hulking, gut-spilling monstrosity that ravaged Darkshire. An elite monster like the orcs of Red Ridge and Hogger. Only Stitches was part of a scripted event to raid Darkshire. Players were once again shown a threat, this time undead, but in pseudo-raid boss format. Demonstrating late-game expectations is one thing, dropping compelling events into the world is another. Both are intelligent. Making them one and the same casts them in a young player's mind like gleaming marble. Darkshire itself was a feast, one of my favorite zones ever. This perpetually gloomy wood, not even a forest, a wood, connected to the other 
brighter human zones. It captured the fantasy of the world in such perfect miniature, demonstrated the power of visual shifts and tonal balance. Leveling in an MMO can be boring, but it doesn't have to be maximally boring. And I think WoW did well in that regard. But I dare say that Stranglethorn makes everything else look like stupid, puny, idiot stuff. The zone is immaculate, right off the road from Darkshire, a flawless visual feast and perfect soundscape. I would argue that I never truly got the WoW experience until I walked into the jungle. I mean, take a look yourself. Every one of us wants to escape at some point, usually into the woods or to a beachside getaway. What if you could do both? Now, Stranglethorn Vale was a dangerous place for many players, not me. I was on a PvE server, so its contested status didn't really affect my experience, and arguably enhanced it. That said, in PvP servers, innocent levelers were regularly torn to shreds by max-level rogues and other ne'er-do-wells lying in wait, licking their lips with glee. The bullying was relentless, eternal. It was expected. It was custom. It was the greatest fiesta for a horrible human being, who I would eventually become years later, but we're shelving that story for now. Stranglethorn highlights something I love about WoW that sometimes I feel other people don't get. Even nowadays, I see various online types commenting on the quality of WoW's visuals, and don't misunderstand, it is a particular style you might not jive with, but the developers were working with a graphical budget stretched as thin as the pixelated leaf textures. They were not hacks. They knew how to lay a gradient. They knew how to contrast colors, and they knew how to work that chunky, antiquarian Warcraft 3 block aesthetic into their MMO. Because WoW is literally based on Warcraft 3, and more than that, they owned that chunk aesthetic in a way that serves the game. How many times have you seen the World of Warcraft pauldron or shoulder armor complaint. I just can't get into the aesthetic. The shoulder armor looks ridiculous. Buddy, first of all, back in vanilla you needed to be level 20 to even equip your first shoulder armor, and it meant something to us, okay? And second, WoW is a cartoonish fantasy. Comic-esque. I mean, look at WoW's male heroes. Any of them could be the face of Grinder, ballooning muscles, and bare-chested men abound. Of course, the shoulder armor and weapons are gigantinormous. They're stylistically distorted, exaggerated pieces to accompany the heroic fantasy the setting is selling. If you had to fight for and earn a pair of hunk and shoulder pads, you might just come around. Not so funny now, is it? I get to be a little decadent, right? This is the most decadent thing I've ever made. The aesthetic of World of Warcraft is something I care about even if it doesn't work at all for Final Fantasy XIV people. For example, as ugly as it can get, polygonally speaking, and as criminally silly as the naming conventions of the world get. I mean, Grom Hellscream, Storm Rage, Whisper Wind, it's like linguistically taking a hammer and hitting the audience square in the f***ing jaw. Frost Wolf, Bronze Beard, Shadow Spear. I still think they sound f***ing badass. They didn't dig around in Latin or anything, they just ripped. Incredibly based. And calling back to my video discussing Elden Ring, the color palettes of World of Warcraft do some tremendously heavy lifting by seeding magic into the land itself. You'll travel through normal, grounded places, sure, but one day you'll arrive in Winter Spring beautiful name, by the way, and be met with stark white snow, deep green pines, and a purple shading effect on everything off in the distance and the sky itself. Despite being a relatively non-magical place, going by the sights and scenes within, the choice of palette elevates the magic of the zone. And this pattern repeats through many zones across many expansions. World of Warcraft has always been fairly ugly up close, but it's an adventure and the gameplay's always in front of you. Gazed at from 10 paces, the World of Warcraft is a lavish, velveteen fantasy. And there's like eight foot swords too, so, I mean, if one of those things isn't doing it for you, 
you. World of Warcraft uses scale to powerful effect, makes the geography, even something as small as trees, enormous. Their trunks 20 players thick, laid lengthwise in some cases. This is aesthetically true to Warcraft 3, which was physically and mechanically blockier than any RTS you've ever played. Everything had f***ed collision. It was abominable. A perpetually clumsy, lumpy sandbag shuffle, but I loved that game to death as well. And it was nothing short of magical entering into the world version of Warcraft 3 and finding the player character incredibly tiny. Surrounded by towering trees boxed in by unscalable mountain ranges, these environments cast the player as a puny, fleeting piece, a fragment of the world. Dust, dwarfed by its scope and grandeur, an apt visual metaphor for an online game that is experienced ephemerally, temporally, the player merely a guest in a world with a rich, palpable history, more chronicled than any player who stands at any given point, at any given time, upon the ashes of far greater soldiers who fought in far greater battles for far greater empires. And what the average player knows is simply what they've seen. The encroaching orcs in Red Ridge, the uprising in Westfall, and a history all around them that they can only guess at. It seems like nothing, but it's the very heart of the experience. Like I said, I was personally struck with the uh, Explorer debuff. I remember taking a genuine interest in every single camp and every single cave, even if they were simple asset paste jobs across zones. I mean, I've played Modern WoW in the last five years. I'm not exploring a cave. You can't make me care about a cave. I know what's in there. Even if I don't, man, I've seen it all. I got old. But back then, setting aside that quests were often tied to any given enemy cluster, there was a nagging feeling that something great could be anywhere. Something that would take me up a step on the ladder. It helped that the developers put little treasure chests in places and rare enemy spawns that could have been anywhere. I didn't have that information, so I crawled my way through every zone with genuine care. Part of WoW's genius is the truth that, in fact, anything can be anywhere. The developers loaded up a series of loot tables for every enemy. Incredibly rare, valuable items could drop from technically any enemy if you took the time to farm said enemy or simply rolled the bones and prayed on your journey forward. Not all rare drops were worth a fortune, but many were. There are manipulative splinters of design, but in practice so obnoxious to farm for any goal-minded player that they simply fade into the background, which only makes them hit harder, more memorably, when you get lucky. I found a blue axe, a rare weapon, sweating, palpitating, in this very veil. Unequipable for my warlock, something fit for a warrior instead, but that's a story for another section of the video. I've gone this far without mentioning the music of World of Warcraft, hoping that by simply playing the tracks you'll understand. It's got good music. Not bangers, but strong, ambient pieces and swelling scores that seem to fit flawlessly zone by zone, capturing a range of instrumentation and styles, the triumphant Stormwind track. the flute in Mulgor, and when they're not slapping you in the face directly upon entering whatever zone, accompanied by that enormous introduction text, it's creeping in after periods of prolonged silence. World of Warcraft sounds like a world ought to. It doesn't contextually rise and mellow out with what you're doing, you know, carving through enemies and skinning their hides. It simply drifts in and out, not unlike Minecraft, and sometimes it hits transcendental because of that. Long, wandering nights in Stranglethorn, mind purely focused on farming gorillas, aren't meaningful by themselves, but the music occasionally wakes you up. You're still in-game, in this vast fantastical world. It ratifies your existence by scoring you as another part of the world. Stranglethorn Vale contains multitudes, lip-moistening marvels beyond compare. It's a cool zone. I'm sorry, the ancient troll ruins in the Zulgarub Empire, the scenic beaches beset by the bloodsail pirates, shipwrecks and coral reefs just off the coast for multi-layered exploration, great rope bridges overlooking crystalline rivers, an oil rig. You can go swimming just off the coast and find treasure among the shipwrecks. 
It's a varied experience, more than most other zones. In fact, Stranglethorn is something like the Mediterranean of Classic WoW, in that the Mediterranean was, in its past, a trading hotspot where people of every walk of life, every shade, crossed paths under the same sun, over the same waters. The perfect locale for a fantasy setting. Stranglethorn, likewise, features Horde and Alliance encampments, neutral parties with reputation bars to fill, a neutral cross-faction auction house, and a ship that sails to the whole other continent of the world of Warcraft. The value lies in its multiplicity. Stranglethorn is equal parts adventure, gateway, bazaar, and battleground. Its most story landmark is here, the Gurubashi Arena. Players of either faction would attend this sacred ring, lining its stony circumference, jittering with visions of glory and treasure. And at the center of the arena, on a very specific schedule, spawned a single treasure chest, the contents of which I never saw in my time playing WoW. I can't even remember the contents, and I've refused to Google it, because it's important to me. When it appeared, Hell's Gates flung wide as players poured into the arena, tearing into each other like animals. At other times, it was something like a standoff. Players weren't actually flagged for PvP until they dropped into the ring, at least on my PvE server. So occasionally, combatants would timidly, daintily drop in one by one, a test of patience, grit, of big dickitude, all for naught as the skulking rogues within inched stealthily towards their marks and dropped hella crits. I joined in at times, though I could never compete. I just wanted a piece of that glory, a wispy fractal of something that felt real. I was cut down in seconds. I returned here to record footage, wondering if it would spark any feeling at all. But that's also a story for another part of the video. If Gurubashi Arena is the most story landmark of Stranglethorn Vale, the greatest landmark is the infamous Booty Bay. If at any point you snicker because you are two, you must now forfeit to me all of your worldly possessions. Booty Bay lies nestled at the southernmost tip of the Eastern Kingdoms. There's no other word for it. It's a jewel, the jewel of Stranglethorn Vale. It's a neutral city run by the Goblins, a race that would become horde playable come the Cataclysm expansion years later, but otherwise, and Therefore, for three major iterations of the game's lifespan, Booty Bay was lorded over not by the I'm not taking the fall for this one, you're the one who got us lost goons, but by the I'm his money friend people. And that's incredible. It was at once a peaceful hub for downtime, crafting, auctioning cross-faction, drinking, RPing, traveling, fishing, meeting, banking, and a nightmare shithole especially on PvP servers, but oftentimes on commerce servers as well. Players flagged for PvP would scrap in the streets, kill each other mercilessly. It was a fiesta in its prime, with only the neutral goblin guards to stop you. Sneaky rogue takedowns and feral druid attacks become trivial, grains of sand. They become moments you render in vague contrails in your mind, not forgotten, very gone, outlines left lingering. I can hear those casual 2007 killings all these years later. Booty Bay is not a major city. It doesn't belong to either faction, nor does it occupy even half the requisite space to be a major city. You tried walking through Stormwind? That is not a walkable city. Even in games, man, shit. But even in its relative walkability, Booty Bay is important. It sits so far from the Dwarven Ironforge and Night Elven Darnassus, even humans trekking from the relatively close Stormwind will find the journey long and arduous, more than likely sinking tens of hours of play into the game before ever reaching this pseudo-city, a place with most of a true city's key amenities. It also serves as a loose quest hub with several efficient leveling quests that unfortunately unlock over a wide range of levels, meaning players would often have to return to Booty Bay specifically after clearing out Stranglethorn and leaving for anywhere else to scrounge up experience before returning. For many players, this quirk makes Booty Bay something of a fork in the road, and again, highlights the general design brilliance of the journey writ large. We've covered the basic tensions of Red Ridge and Westfall, but thereafter the player enters Stranglethorn Vale, witnessing their first zone-facilitated cross-faction conflicts. After all, a horde base camp lies in the middle of the zone. And finally, arriving in Booty Bay, they're given the chance to cross the sea in a ship 
to take the fight to the enemy, all the way from the Eastern Kingdoms to Kalimdor, dropped into a horde-favoring zone with no immediate or direct quest hub or even amenity access. Bankers, class trainers, profession trainers, anything? Without walking through some dangerous territory depending on your server preference. My first trip to Stranglethorn ended like so many others, shunted from the zone by a lack of quests and in need of XP to continue. So my adventure, and the direction of this story, derails here, into much more personal territory, after this point. And before we get there, I've been forgetting someone really important. My brother. You might be wondering about my other brother at this point, but he didn't buy into that monthly fee nonsense, and besides, he was too busy playing his much more villainous MMORPG, an odious little game called Run Escape. But my brother and I, unlike him, were not cowards. We did not run, nor escape. We waged war in the world of Warcraft. My brother began his journey on the stark green prairies of Mulgor, the Torin starting area. He picked a hunter and spent his time diligently questing through the zone. I never watched him play, really, or asked him anything about his experience unless it was relevant to something I was doing, or a shared point of interest. And so, really, I have no idea how my brother's time went. Going by Mulgor's soundtrack, its stunning color and simplicity, and the awe-inspiring Torin Capital Thunder Bluff, I imagine it was nothing short of f***ing magical. What's notable is his starting class. The hunter uses ranged weapon attacks, bows, and guns as the fulcrum of their skill set. Something that sets them apart from every other class in the game. They have incredible utility via abilities and immense kiting potential, making them some of the most effective and efficient solo leveling classes in the game, and bane of certain melee classes in PvP. They can trap enemies, slow and disorient and poison foes, churn out a steady barrage of damage from a distance, they can play dead. And that's all before getting into animal companions. Hunters find and tame wild beasts live. You have to go into the world. And this is the most lethal iteration of it for the sake of historical accuracy, and make whatever animal you want to make your pet love you, all while it's taking chomps out of your crotch. No other class in the game needs to connect with the world at this level, but hunters have the tools to handle it. That said, the hunter has limitations. Players need to stockpile ammo, arrows, bullets, or bolts to ensure that they can keep their best skills and major source of damage available. They have to mind their range, even with the Fame Death ability, which drops all enemy aggro, because their damage potential and functional utility drop precipitously in melee combat. So, vanilla hunters were defined by mindfulness and upkeep. Regarding their pets too, actually, I remember thinking I could never play a hunter for that reason. Years prior, we played Neo pets, and after I adopted four virtual pets, a Corbat, a Shoiru, a Kugra, and some other fourth creature that I was constantly getting bored of and abandoning like a sociopathic demon. I grew bored, and my pets starved. While I felt bad, I couldn't seem to feed them enough. I wouldn't make the same mistake twice. So far, I've only given a glimpse into the human perspective. Alliance dwarves and gnomes follow the same functional progression path in Loch Madan and the wetlands before getting to Booty Bay level range, generally speaking, but have other zones to progress through if they wish. Night Elves will travel from Teldrassil to Darkshore and finally to Ashenvale, maybe hopping over to the Eastern Kingdoms via boat at some point. And humans can also just duck all the routes I've listed thus far, but I'm listing the main one. It's hard to say if these routes imply the same world narrative that my own did, though Night Elves will come into direct contact with orcs deforesting sacred land in Ashenvale, and dwarves will often meet with a draconian invasion in the wetlands. And let's consider the Horde Zones. A fresh Torin hunter will, generally, level through Mulgore, learning about the centaur threat to that specific race, join up with orc and troll players in the staggeringly far-reaching barrens, both physically 
and numerically. It's enormous. It stretches from levels 10 to 33. I mean, that's just crazy. But Horde players have a little choice, being able to fork off into the Stone Talon Mountains, a zone I have absolutely no nostalgia for, or the Undead Zone Silver Pine Forest. Horde zones in general can be beautiful, but it's often a stark beauty, or a withering beauty, or a momentary, fleeting beauty cast amidst genuinely barren geography, flat plains and plain hills. The same draw to the caves and crannies exists, but they're not quite as lush and joyful as Alliance Zones in general. I think it's what spawned the infamous Barons chat, that bored teenagers had to entertain themselves in this massive, poorly cropped playpen and thus spun so much vile dumbassery into one single zone's chat as to birth an interplayer cultural expectation perpetuated by the very same people who post low-res Imgur memes on their Facebook hometown group chat so powerfully that it resurged with no temporal friction whatsoever at the dawn of classic WoW. Blizzard's repackaged vanilla World of Warcraft experience sold some 20 years after its birth. The psychological ramifications of the Barons and Blizzard Entertainment's World of Warcraft are a criminally underrated subject of clinical study. The questions burn manifold in my brain. What stories does my brother have to tell? How did he experience the game? Does he have a totally different nostalgia from mine? Are some of the scenes I'm showing meaningful to him? Did he like Thousand Needles? Did he like the Shimmering Flats? Did he like Desolus? I could call, but I won't. He's busy with his life, and I'm doing my little YouTube thing. And really, I don't need that info to make a video. I just want to feel that nostalgia. I want to drink greedily from another player's joy. I want to thieve a piece of a moment in time to covet, even with everything I've already got. I've implied that Horde Zones are boring, and that's not always true. I had no trouble blazing through Classic WoW with my undead priest. I like the game just fine, but what does a 13-year-old think about the Barons? What's truly disturbing is that my brother outpaced me massively. We had the same time to play. We both had a main character, and critically, we were both playing pet classes, two of the easiest leveling classes in the game. My brother had planes to run and mountains to climb, literally, but high or low, it's all brown, baby. And I was gifted with the awe-inspiring, heroic, legendary Elwyn to strangle Thorn Run. Was he simply more interested in progression than I was? Could he have been a more focused, diligent player? Do I have some kind of mildly undiagnosed ADHD? I have a theory about my brother. When I really think back, I recall that we both liked to play around with different side characters, but he really liked his hunter. Even then, I loved my warlock, but I wanted the world. I wanted the warrior charge ability and big two-handed weapons. I wanted the ability to heal on a whim. I wanted to stealth and backstab, but not level up all the way again to do it. I wanted to play every class. If only critically acclaimed MMORPG Final Fantasy XIV existed in 2007. My brother ended up at least 10 full levels ahead of me by the end. A kingly number. The fruit of genuine dedication, especially on an hour or two at a time. Maybe he was bored of the barons or didn't care all that much about exploration. I spent so many hours just swimming. Literally swimming at the edges of zones, trying to find holes and ways and vantage points, hidden caves and discoveries. I often tried to find back routes into zones where none existed. I fought the ocean fatigue bar and lived. I was obsessed with charting the world, but it goes deeper. We both played pet classes, but everything about mine, minus the class quests required to unlock new demons, everything else came easy. My pets were summoned with soul stones you could stockpile training an enemy to death with an ability, something you could do as part of your regular damage rotation. Consume a stone and summon a demon. They were disposable. My brother had to hunt down, tame, feed, and care for his pet. He invested in his pet. My mana regenerated with water and time, mana being the lifeblood of all magic. My brother, to keep his damage up, had to purchase his ammo, 
keep track of his ammo, he had to invest in his damage and manage his mana bar because vanilla hunters had a mana bar and not this weird focus thing. I was handed a compelling through line between zones featuring some of the most legendary sights and scenes known to the world of Warcraft. My brother got a series of flat places, storied in their time and sometimes beautiful, but I'm sure he wanted out. Warlock and Hunter, Alliance and Horde, absolute worlds of difference in pathos, in vibes. One last thing about my brother. My brother is pushing ahead in his life, collecting degrees, learning past my own long resting laurels, chasing a career, going further beyond, blazing trails. He has a kid now. He's got his sh** together, and I'm playing f***ing World of Warcraft in 2023, 16 years later, unable to put my goddamn baby toys down. And fair enough, I built all of this, my little soapbox with the first true effort I think I ever made in my life. And now I have the privilege to pontificate about the world of Warcraft and reflect on old memories and masturbate all on my little soapbox. I painted it myself. It took so long to build, you know? Now, elves, orcs, and others, it's time to discuss the uncomfortable times. Well, my brother pulled away like a ship you barely missed upon entering Booty Bay, for example, I chose instead to languish. At some point, I grew bored with leveling and became increasingly distracted by everything else. For a very long time, quests from Booty Bay, specifically, sat piled in my quest log, forever uncompleted because I chose to run off elsewhere, for no real reason either. I would simply explore, like I always did, collect trinkets and buy cool swords, waste time. But it was time I enjoyed. Normal people might call this fun, or endearing, or even actually the right way to play a computer game. But I couldn't help feeling like a bit of a failure. I just didn't have the drive, like my brother, something reflected in our real life. Both of my brothers cared about school, about performing well. They chose deliberately to watch the Discovery Channel and the History Network instead of cartoons. You can imagine the inadequacy I felt just wanting to play Final Fantasy Tactics and watch Inuyasha. And there was no shortage of incentives to get questing. Those high-level warlock rewards were juicy. Very few classes got a free mount, something a player first purchased at the esteemed 40th level and only after purchasing riding training, restricting mounts to penny pinchers, profession grinders, mages farming portal service tips, and auctioneers. But paladins and warlocks got mounts free of charge, and what's more, warlocks got a fiery horse, and then a spiky fiery horse that they summoned from hell. At the tail end of warlock progression, one could eventually learn the venerated Doomguard summoning ritual, an ambrosially flavorful spell that required another person in the ritual to sacrifice their life to generate a powerful demon for the warlock, which was not freely under the warlock's control. You needed to use the tame demon ability on top of that, which could miss or be resisted to control the thing at all. And that controllability had a timer and had to be leveled up like any other spell for a fee. If that isn't firing your brain, I mean, well, maybe you just don't get wow. And you definitely don't get me. Needless to say, it's about the most badass sh in the world of Warcraft. Class differences and utility skills matter. They added texture to the game. And Warlocks, it's absurd that I ever fell out of love with WoW considering how flavorful and useful they are. Powerful DPS, depending on the patch, a party-wide buff with the Imp, health stones for consumable self and party healing, soul stones to resurrect yourself or your healer or tank during a dungeon run, the ability to siphon health off of your demon, multiple different demons for tanking, PvP, killing mages, powerful crowd control, the ability to summon people in your party to your exact location with a ritual that only required one additional helper. F***ing water breathing. Warlocks may have had zero mobility, but goddamn, they were a Swiss army knife class, truly quirked up. Lastly, and most importantly, a warlock could summon, with the help of a special reagent, because it was just that level of flavorful, full umami burst. We're talking MSG, oyster sauce, you name it. The warlock could summon from the sky itself, 
an infernal. That dread meteor demon of Warcraft legend. The thing? The warlock from the intro FMV? Summons! You can do that! Hey, young child, you can do that! So it wasn't for a lack of incentive, it was personal. Maybe it was the boring fetch quest design causing fatigue. Maybe the World of Warcraft was just too expansive, too rich or convoluted for my young mind, which had been not even slightly tested by Golden Sun years prior. And so I left Booty Bay, the world itself behind, for war. At this exact point in my adventure, I'd spent nearly all my game time in the Eastern Kingdoms, but Kalimdor, that entire second continent, lay a single boat ride away. All that the curious player needed to do was find a ship. Ships to Kalimdor were placed in the wetlands, where dwarf and gnome players congregated through natural progression, and Booty Bay. I traveled both routes at different times across the sea from Booty Bay to Ratchet to help raid the local horde quest hub, the crossroads, and from the wetlands port city to Dustwallow Marsh, another mid-range questing zone that connected directly to the Barrens. It's as depressing as its name, and notably the only somewhat human-controlled territory linked directly to other Alliance forces, a bastion against the Horde, and it's in shambles. A single charred tavern stands between the hopeless gray of the bog and the triumphant sun of the enemy territory, tipping my hat to the developers for the thousandth time. World of Warcraft was always impeccable at setting the tone, inspiring wonder and fear and curiosity. It's something you, if you never played WoW at a young age, probably can't understand. Even on classic WoW's launch, I had no real wonder left to give, just an efficient leveling route, and a bottomless pit in my heart to fill. All sense of adventure, having long since been drained by adulthood, competitive games, and hubris. A disturbing need to perform in a video game. But in those days, even drowning in HUD elements, nameplates, action bars, I felt meaningfully compelled to strike into enemy territory. Conflict in World of Warcraft was, to me, the perfect intersection of everything that made the game compelling. A chance to look or even be powerful, a grand, encompassing narrative that made the experience dramatic. Teammates to prop me up and enemies to cut down. I knew exactly what I wanted out of the game once I hit Booty Bay, but I wasn't sure how to get it. After all, I didn't think I could catch up with my brother, and questing was boring. Games were supposed to be fun, right? So I got curious. Wandering off of Ratchet's perimeter, I found the fun again, using my mastery of exploration and the associated mechanics. Jumping. Jumping I learned in my travels, by the way, I sussed out a secret back entrance to the orc starting zone. If you were a clever Alliance player, you could take the ship to Ratchet, walk over to the cliffs that cordoned off the zone from the ill-intentioned public, and jump up and over with some simple neutral jumping and a forward input after the jump to prevent the usual sliding that the devs ensured would otherwise handle anyone getting too curious. I landed in the orc starting zone. On PvE servers, player versus environment servers, one could simply type slash PvP to flag themselves or make themselves attackable to enemy faction members. Now, the important thing to remember is that you, the player, cannot strike anyone not flagged for PvP. An alliance member and a Horde member can stand two feet apart in a game called World of Warcraft and be physically incapable of attacking each other on PvE servers. Unless they entered some special zone or a PvP match, I may have entered the starting zone, but I couldn't do anything, and because I wasn't level 60, the guards would have flattened me in seconds. This is getting embarrassing. I found that if I flagged myself, I could convince a curious newcomer to approach jump, maybe wave, or slash tickle my avatar, or slash fart my avatar, but occasionally one would attack, flagging them for PvP, which meant I could cast, say, Shadow Bolt and send them to the Shadow Realm in a single hit, or cast Curse of Agony, an instant cast damage over time spell that would kill them a few seconds after they started running, or have my Voidwalker pummel them. And what's worse 
is the graveyard was very close by. Resurrecting in WoW is a little weird. You die, your equipment degrades, and you're made to walk your spirit to your corpse and hit resurrect within a 30-foot radius, or resurrect at the graveyard itself with a 90% stat debuff that lasts 10 minutes. So most newcomers wanted to jump right back into playing. Resurrecting maintained the PvP flag unless they stayed put for five real-life minutes. So I torched them until they stopped trying or logged out. Or some high-level player rode in and killed me. And then I would also log out. Man, this is gross. I did all this, partly trolling, partly role-playing, partly bored out of my mind because questing through zones to kill 30 gorillas for fur or something was just too much for my teenage brain. Looking back, I'm kind of amused. It's funny in a way, but also really kind of disgusting. Focused questing is trivially easy for me now, and that's how I chose to spend my time? Like, yes, acknowledge, those players were technically stupid for flagging themselves, for not swapping characters sooner, for whatever other evil justification I had, and the rules couldn't stop me from doing this. Or at least no one ever reported me, to my knowledge. One player I remember was pretty upset and logged onto an Alliance character just to message me about how stupid I was. I remember specifically the phrase, You're so ugly, your mom needed to tie a pork chop to your neck so the dog would play with you. With you. Which sounds really f***ing funny nowadays, but at the time, I was horrified. I hadn't considered once that someone might log on to another character, crossing the faction divide, to yell at me, so I acted contrite and apologetic. I messaged back and forth, trying to assuage this justifiably angry person and tell them I was sorry, after corpse camping their level 1 character relentlessly. Like, there's gotta be a psychiatrist in the audience, and I'm telling you, I don't like the prognosis on that. I know some people at this point are probably thinking, K Bash, why are you even making this video? And I think, earnestly, it's because World of Warcraft contains a lot of good in my mind, a lot of precious nostalgia for something I can't ever have back. But it also houses a lot of my ugliness as a person. 14 or not, that's no way to act towards people. And it's especially gross in retrospect now that I'm imagining the people I did this to. High-level enemy players very rarely appeared in new player zones. Nobody had a flying mount because they didn't exist yet, and those zones weren't exclusively populated by new players. After all, everyone had side characters. But many were. What if they were new players and they were just curious? Just wanted to poke the bear for fun. Why would they assume the worst? Yes, Internet 2007, etc. But still, it's an MMO. Social behavior's basically the experience, the reason to play at all. You'll notice most of my experience wasn't particularly social. And what if they were knowledgeable players? What if they just wanted to tap my avatar for fun, the way two players might jump at each other to speak without speaking? Looking back, I was willing to terrorize innocent people acting innocently, and the game didn't have an opinion on this behavior. Arguably, it's a punishable offense via report. It counts as harassment now, I think, but no one ever did. You'd think this all bored me faster than questing, but I tried in other places. I remember very clearly trying to pass... <laughs> trying to pass for a hostile NPC in a human stronghold just a light jog off from that very orcish starting zone, I tried to blend in like a strangely dressed chameleon with my matching outfit to slap idiots with a curse of agony, and it worked at least once. Do you have any idea the sheer level of gag manga, Tom and Jerry dumbassery it takes a person to pull this kind of thing? Every other NPC is clearly marked at an appropriate level. My character clearly stood out and had a player's nameplate, a guild indicator. For God's sake. I don't have a psychological take on this one. It's, it's just funny. <laughs> These strange journeys crept on and my leveling progress stultified, but I was left waiting for someone to attack me, doing the same boring things, harassing the same meaningless targets. I knew I wanted to be a hero of the Alliance on paper, but if what that amounted to was bullying low-level characters I could kill in one hit, 
One thing I partook in from the earliest possible moment was World of Warcraft's PvP Battlegrounds. WoW might be known for its arena, especially on Twitch, and I've played a lot of arena too, but the arena didn't exist in vanilla World of Warcraft. We had, instead, three Battlegrounds, which unlocked at different level tiers. The first and most commonly played was Warsong Gulch, a simple capture the flag type game with murder. The second, Arathi Basin, was a King of the Hill style map of sprawling scope and elevation that made it hard to win without coordination. The third and most coveted, Alterag Valley, was legendary in that games could drag out for hours, actual hours, and longer, allegedly days. Though I never saw it myself, it functioned more like a mixture of PvE and PvP than anything else, a resource game with key targets both geographical and humanoid. It was a story, a veritable epic, exactly what WoW PvP should aspire to in a world where both of its elements were balanced in harmony. But in those days, I mostly stuck to Warsong Gulch. In theory, PvP was perfect for me, but at the time, and unlike the WoW of today, it wasn't a path to progression, the way it can be now especially regarding equipment. Players waited in queue, loaded in, and prayed their time wasn't wasted so they could stockpile tokens to eventually cash in for rewards. That wasn't why I was playing, though. I just wanted to kill people. Because that's cool. In fact, a good chunk of why I was so far behind my brother probably had to do with PvP. But not just regular PvP. Twink PvP. If you've never heard the term twink in the WoW context, because it has one, I'm begging you to stop giggling. Twink PvP most commonly occurred in those days at level 19. Players would stockpile the strongest gear, enchant their equipment, and head into battle ready to slaughter hapless foes. No different than what I was doing with Innocence in Duratar, but contextualized as an activity, not critically as harassment, collecting flags while slaughtering innocent lobies. I encountered many of these players on my warlock and frankly wanted to be them. I hated them, sure, but I could feasibly become one of them. This possibility, this potential new identity combined with the blue axe I found in Stranglethorn Vale led to the creation of a whole secondary character, the Dwarf Warrior Iron Axe. It's a cool name, right? Boring in a literal sense, but straightforward. To the point, you know, Iron Axe. Badass. It's badass. The game at level 19 is simple and fun. Any given class has a handful of buttons, much fewer than at level cap, and carving through low-level players. Even battling with other similarly twinked competition is fun and frenetic. It's not mindless destruction. You still have to play the macro game, the actual flag running and returning to win. And even if you don't, you can still nab a few cheap kills on poorly geared players. Iron Axe was not geared perfectly, something some people would insist is the point of twinking a character. I have long touted that perfection is a scam. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. These were the words imparted to me by the most charismatic and intelligent man I ever knew. And he was, and is, indisputably correct, but not perfectly correct. The sheer level of dedication and gold required to craft the perfect twink character was something I simply couldn't fund with my warlock's meager wallet. Nor did I have the time or knowledge to find the perfect set of pieces, so I opted for a decent set of gear, some average enchantments I made on my warlock, and my very own iron axe. It wasn't even the best in slot weapon, maybe like five to 10, arguably the most important piece of equipment for any melee class, but it was good enough and it bought me into that world. Suddenly I could queue with other legends of the Alliance in the level 10 to 19 bracket. A gnome warrior brandishing sword and shield, little brown mustache string-like and profoundly embarrassing. I remember him best of all, though the name escapes me. There was a night elf druid who healed us and stole flags like nobody else. There was a perfect Defias rogue cosplay twink who I aspired to be like one day. And it wasn't just us. Back then, PvP games were server specific. So every female undead rogue twink, every Torin hunter twink, every male troll priest twink stuck with you, became your sworn enemy. Nowadays, any given match is connected to the greater server multiverse, making names basically meaningless. 
But then and there, for a number of years, other Twink players weren't just players. They were fully canon World of Warcraft characters, at least in my mind. People you made and charted arcs with. Some may say Twinks should be demolished, to which I respond, this all sounds horrible out of context. World of Warcraft, Warcraft more broadly, is based in the roots of heroic fantasy. Heroes, named characters, are everything. Every player has a favorite good or bad guy from Illidan Stormrage to Sylvanas Whisperwind to Arthas Menethil to Grom Hellscream. Character in the world of Warcraft is everything. That's the fantasy I was keyed into, what I aspired to be. And Twink PvP was the very closest I ever got, even years later, to scraping the scum from the surface of that storied pond with my bony, alien-esque fingers. But eventually, like all things, I lost interest. My character wasn't strong enough, capable of handling various low-skill players like myself and low-level players, sure, but the high-end rogues ripped me apart and priests made killing impossible. I couldn't contribute like other members of my team, never quite as much anyway, and that got spelled out numerically on the post-game scorecard. And that was probably why I put my axe down, put the game in context, and walked back to my warlock. All those grandiose dreams of heroism performed as meaningless, recordless busywork with only in-game trinkets, marks of honor, to prove they ever happened. Maybe I was just kidding myself. The road lay bare before me, a road with no fixed ending, not even a horizon, simply a path sought off some meters ahead by a fuzzy white edge leading into a great white expanse. The ladder I envisioned myself climbing had long since abandoned me, maybe pulled up from under by my brother, and my goal was no longer tangible. I told myself, level cap, infernal, those sorts of short-term passing interests to motivate myself eventually to keep moving forward. Walking long roads and burning through countless monsters, I sought new kinds of fun. At one point, I collected matching gear to dress up, look cooler to other players. Aesthetics mattered in the world of Warcraft, not dissimilarly to medieval Englishmen wearing clothes made of purple dye. That early game dress haunted me long enough to sting, but it was difficult and unnecessary to create quality wardrobe. Statistically, any outfit that wasn't part of a high-end rating or PvP set or for Twink PvP was functionally worthless or lower quality. And most players, the real ones, didn't care. They took their lumps wearing purple gloves, red helmets, green pants. They didn't just look ridiculous. They looked obscene and they reveled in it. That is until Transmog came around in later expansions fundamentally warping the player relationship with crafted, rewarded, or looted gear, but let's set that aside because looking cool is awesome. This costume fascination would have put me in the role player camp, but I didn't do much communicating with others. At one point I tried to create my own guild, the Bloodblade Pirates. Nothing at all like the Booty Bay based Blood Sail Buccaneers. This was the Bloodblade Pirates. Guilds for the uninitiated are the backbone of social interaction in World of Warcraft. Free companies for you FF14 people. You can talk to people in general chat, but those are just randoms. Guilds were special. Planned events and dungeon nights and raid nights. Guilds were teams of players. I actually spent the money to officiate my charter, putting me further behind on my warlock ability levels, and solicited the requisite number of signatures. And it was entirely aesthetic. I didn't want a guild. Not really. I wanted a cool guild title. Under my nameplate, I was 14. But what disturbs me about these misguided ventures is that stark and apparent hollowness of them. Cool names, cool clothes, these things are cute, but empty. They bespeak no heroism or mastery or wisdom. Style can be substance, but I certainly never heard as much growing up, which means they were... At some point, I fell into a guild myself, disbanding the pirates in the process. Sad but necessary. Rip and piss, Bloodblade pirates. Literally no one remembers you but me. I don't remember who invited me to my guild or why. I hadn't really engaged with other players meaningfully, except for my friends who played. And even that was uncommon. I was a pretty active kid, all told. While my friends had their own things to deal with, or more likely, plenty of free time. 
assholes. I was stuck doing things I'm now grateful for in retrospect. Scouts, paper delivery, music lessons, corn detasseling one summer. I defy you to leave a comment if you've ever detasseled corn. Go on. All three of you. World of Warcraft is an MMO. Massively multiplayer. And despite my mother's insistence that the internet was full of files, and she was right, I wanted to reach out into that world. I entered this guild, the Templar Knights. I think it's pretty telling that these were my first sort of online friends. And I remember many of their names to this day. Cherish the memories despite knowing them for only a year and never talking to them again. Hence, you'd be questing along while guild chat bubbled with light convos. Housewives called you on. People asked for help and got it. I think anyone who knows me and knows my channel knows that I play a lot of games solo, even infamously multiplayer games, and I don't ask for much. If I ever ask you for something directly, it might be the third time that year. And asking for help in-game? There was a healing energy in that guild. It didn't matter that I was a kid and most of these people were adults. We were all avatars. I mean, I really may as well have been 50 to these people, judging by my character. For a socially unsure teenager, it was a place of belonging. There was Gabriel Gorn, the Astaire Guildmaster, a human paladin of presumably incredible power. I thought, wow, a human paladin for a guildmaster, just like Arthas Menethil. We never really talked, not to my recollection, but in my impressionable and anxious state, he felt like a living legend. I mean, not just anyone got to be guildmaster. Right? There was Winter Huntress, a sarcastic, no-nonsense guildmate who was studying something at the time. She was older than me. I have an extremely vivid memory of grinding through the Zulfurak dungeon in Tenaris with guildmates. Back then, I was happy to do dungeon runs with guildies because I got to be part of the group. It was cool, and as a warlock, I knew I could provide utility. I could buff my online friends with my imp. I could give them health stones and resurrect my tank. I mattered. And better yet, they probably didn't mind having me because of the warlock summoning ritual, and I was happy to blaze off to the dungeon and wait until everyone else was ready. I loved being useful. Anyway, Zulfurak, Winter Huntress was there, and I was basically role-playing out of, I want to say joy, that hype you feel surrounded by friends in a multiplayer game. I was screaming at the trolls with the slash yell command, something that serves no purpose at all, excited by doing co-op with guildies. And Winter Huntress left the scathing, resonant question in party chat. What are you? 13? I was. That single remark stuck with me so long and struck so deep, I think it may well have been responsible for my broader reclusion from general chats and forums until YouTube and Twitter. I'm not even kidding about that. I never got overly friendly online again until over a decade later. In fact, I'd say until this very year, 2023. I've looked this player up since. Actually, I've looked them all up and warped some names, but none of them exist anymore, except for Winter Huntress. She has a YouTube channel with raid videos. Same name, same class, same server. It could be coincidence, but it'd be one hell of a coincidence. The night I looked her up, I happened to be in my feelings and I was seized with this visceral need to contact her, like email her, ask her how things have been, how life went for her, <laughs> if she remembered me at all. I don't think there's anything sadder than hunting down some real person's YouTube channel as an old kind of acquaintance and imagining interrogating that person about their life. In that moment, I felt exactly how I felt when she asked me if I was 13 and chose, as then, to say nothing. Last, at least among the characters who stick out most, was Marvish and Hallie, a dwarf hunter and a night elf druid. They were actually girlfriend and boyfriend and great fun to talk to, engage with online. Just good-natured people all around. In fact, they were engaged. I was so excited at that possibility as a kid, which is kind of weird in retrospect, but these people felt so real to me that I wanted to go to the online version of the wedding, at least. They were my online friends, and that would be the right thing to do. I went on vacation with my family while they got married. I... It's so unbelievably stupid and petty and small. I don't know what happened to them. Maybe they're divorced. Maybe they're not. But these little experiences and memories have stuck around so long 
Someone recently asked me why my videos get sentimental sometimes. And the truth is, I've always been sentimental. It's just buried under layers of performative, functioning person behavior. But you can't create this long and hide your true self. I think World of Warcraft gave me a safe and exploratory venue for social interaction. I was always an awkward kid, and I've always sucked at social situations. Been outright terrified of them most of my life. But wow, let me be. I owe so much to it. The joy of belonging is still palpable years later. At some point, the guild's bank and gathered resources were entirely emptied by the guildmaster, Gabriel Gorn, who vanished from the guild overnight, with someone else taking his place. He wasn't a legend at all. It turns out the Templar Knights was a burner guild for some raider trying to farm materials through the efforts of other people, clean the bank, and dip. Eventually, I left the Templar Knights and my little found family behind. The leader was a fraud. Winter Huntress was mean, and I missed Marvish and Hallie's wedding. I didn't actually belong there at all. I can't remember if I realized that none of it was real then, or if I'm realizing that now. I wandered Azeroth for a very long time without a purpose. The Burning Crusade was on the way, and I had to reach level cap. I crawled dungeons with random parties and slogged through the remaining zones. Eventually, I fell into some guild called Phoenix Rising, which I don't remember very well, only that it was a somewhat serious raiding guild at the time, and they didn't allow swearing in chat. One time I watched someone dump a full ASCII middle finger and get instantly banned. One time I said fuck accidentally and immediately said sorry and maintained my guild member status. It was stifling, but I stayed because they were raiders, something I couldn't accurately imagine. 40-man endgame super dungeons. It sounded impossible. These people must be amazing, you know? So I got some questing done and finally crept into the 50s, finding the resolve to ignore the superficial elements of play, ignore the other players, and especially ignore PvP because it wasn't conducive to leveling up. And my fuse burnt out. I ultimately left my warlock at level 59, barely at the doorstep to the burning portal, and never played him again. The Burning Crusade was a spot of joy, still, and I poured every ounce of my free time into a completely new character, a Blood Elf Rogue. This time, I told myself I would do it right. I ripped through the stunningly beautiful Eversong Woods and crept through the dreaded ghost lands. And yet, as I ground up my way through the new starting zones and journeyed routes both new and old, my brother stayed the course and leveled his hunter, climbing ever higher playing through dungeons. I think he may have actually used Ventrilo at like 14 or 15 to coordinate with teammates in WoW Online. That stuff blows my mind. I never had the guts. I was just too anxious. And eventually, I realized I couldn't keep it up. I loved the rogue class and I loved WoW, but I wasn't meant to be the hero. I wanted to be. I mean, by that point, I was playing a horde character. The fantasy was shattered. The dream collapsed. I just didn't have the strength. So, limply, I told my brother that I didn't want to play World of Warcraft anymore, and that I wouldn't be helping to pay for any more game cards. As inconsequential and pathetic and nonsensical as it is, of all the things I feel bad about regarding my brothers, that's the thing I feel worst about. Even today, we were kids, corn money or not, the burden of WoW was better shouldered with two people breaking terms of service together. And I left him to die. Man. I think eventually he dropped off as well, though I can't remember exactly when, but I'm sure it was my fault. By then I'd moved on to Diablo 2 and eventually Warcraft 3. Missing out on the Burning Crusade and level 60 meant that I had to leave not only my dreams of having a full level 60 mount, my flaming horny hellsteed forever unclaimed, but also the allure of the flying mount. I saw a game with dragons that you could ride and put it down. I don't mean to belabor the point, I just want to fully convey the direness of the situation. I cut ties completely, or so I thought. Wow, never really left me. I'm going to compress a lot of my history after vanilla here. 
I went through high school entirely without World of Warcraft because I was too busy working nearly full time through grade 10, getting dropped off from the school bus at 3 and working till 11 at the local coffee shop and having a girlfriend. That means I missed World of Warcraft for the tail end of the Burning Crusade, the Wrath of the Lich King expansion entirely, probably the most well-remembered period in WoW's history, and moving out of high school into university, I managed to ignore Cataclysm, a significantly less well-remembered time in WoW's history that launched the online careers of various people whose channels I watched. I even managed to avoid Mists of Pandaria until the very last major content patch in my fourth year of university. After roundly rejecting it as a ridiculous direction for the series, as though anyone asked for an expansion about the place Chen Stormstout came from, well, turns out Mists was badass. I wasn't a kid anymore. I mean, mentally, I kind of was. But I'd gone through significantly more pain by then, and at least three crushing service industry jobs, and I was 20-something. I was trying to get into law school, I was in a shitty renting situation, and school was mostly fine. I had plenty of free time. But nothing really made me happy. I would go to class, and then do my work, study for law school, and play video games. Turning on World of Warcraft again, genuinely, and I say this as someone who has left my home country for a full calendar year to teach in South Korea. Turning on World of Warcraft again felt like coming home. I played a Blood Elf Priest and had more fun leveling solo than I think I ever had with the game. No one was timing me, my limits were almost nil. I could actually play in a way that felt right for the first time. I remember questing and on the rare occasion tossing out heals at dying players. And the way that sh it's escaping my rapidly crumbling youth and the fear of my eventual fate in the workforce, I sunk an unholy amount of time into the game. It's worth noting that I didn't play on the old account. I think it was under my brother's email address, and frankly, he'd gotten the most real use out of it. I was fine leaving my failed history as history. I shot straight through a number-crunched, streamlined, fast-laned version of the game I loved so much. It never occurred to me that I was losing the experience, the nuance and flavor. I was happy to ignore my responsibilities and seek meaning in the virtual world. I used the modern Dungeon Finder queue and healed parties through content I'd never engaged with, all the way up to Cataclysm Dungeons. Cata Dungeons were interesting because, unlike most other dungeon content at the time, and especially during that time, parties could actually die if people weren't paying attention to the mechanics. That wasn't an issue prior, generally speaking. Simple numbers and button application and adequate knowledge handled most dungeons well, especially in this post-experience-boosting heirloom equipment era that busted up the early levels like nothing. So being the healer, finally playing well, being generally depressed, and watching players wipe the entire party by being careless constantly drove me insane. I started getting verbal online after years of saying nothing, but this time, more cruelly. I would disparage people for not knowing mechanics, for not reading my explanations, for choosing the tank, but not reading up on the responsibilities. I started a vote to kick one tank once, and it made you type in a reason for the kick, and I wrote, quote, Noop Lord, until eventually someone told me that I was being kind of an asshole and ruining other people's fun. The thing is, I've both met and been in circles of people that would have either reaction, like, wow, that's horrifying, K-Bash, or that's funny. And while I've decided on the former, when you don't care about anything, cruel feels acceptable. I often believe that cruel comments are a result of the person behind the screen being in a rough place mentally. And I think that because I know that person, though only briefly. In my first two years of university, before picking up the World of Warcraft, again, I was busy trying to take gaming more seriously. I didn't want to be a scrub nobody at games. I wanted to be good. I was getting into fighters. I wanted my game time to matter. I went online to play competitive fighters, a habit that sprouted out of Soul Calibur 4 in high school, but which fully manifested with Super Street Fighter 4. For that brief time, I foolishly looked at casual, non-multiplayer experiences as wasted 
client, not capable of leading to money and not representing any kind of tangible skill. In a way, competitive fighters were my attempt at coping with my latent gaming addiction and my personal mediocrity. Though I no longer think this way, and it's a story for another time, and I beat it out of myself by the time I got back to WoW, I think it's from the same family of beliefs that led to my interest in World of Warcraft's PvP. I was never a raider. Why would you fight the PC when you can fight real humans? It's just a computer. I played Raid Finder content to gear up so I could get unlockable green fire on my fresh undead warlock, earned through a significant solo challenge. In fact, I played through most old raids retroactively, solo, and focused, as usual, on PvP. Casual mostly, though I occasionally dipped into arena play as well. This brought me to use my freely given for purchasing the expansion max level token on a rogue, a class I'd wanted at level cap since my first adventures in WoW. I leveled up multiple other characters as well because playing PvP casually, your fun only goes as far as your commitment to your character. And frankly, I wasn't committed to anything. I just wanted more. Old habits crept in. With a decently geared rogue, I realized I could be the being of myth, the rogue ganker, an archetype famous through WoW's history specifically for its relevance in Stranglethorn Vale. But I was on a PvE server, yet again, too afraid to risk mild inconvenience and direct conflict with other players, people doing to me what I had done to them. So, as one does when stressed and depressed, I stagnated. I wandered from the mists of Pandaria zones all the way to my old cherished memories, Darkshire, and killed quest-giving NPCs aggressively, flagging me for PvP. This, in turn, baited newer players to attack me, maybe assuming they could get a quick kill with the help of the guards, or maybe unaware of how the flagging system worked. Well, I was always gaining and losing players. That'll happen in a subscription-type game, but the same draw that lured me out of hiding lured plenty of newcomers as well. I tore every self-flagging newbie to ribbons, quickly sprinted away before stronger players could swoop in, and vanished, and corpse camped any player I could until geared raiders showed up to deal with the problem. At which point I'd promptly switch to my priest and enjoy the game otherwise. It's really kind of amazing what your brain gets up to when it feels the walls closing in very, very slowly. I stopped ganking players sometime after because it was meaningless. I watched PvP streamers on occasion, and all of them were doing what seemed like much more important and attainable things. So for the years following, from teacher's college to working in South Korea, I engaged in consistently casual WoW leveling and PvP, with some raid finders sprinkled in. I leveled a hunter just like my brother. I ground up a whole new warlock from scratch. I loved playing the game as a warrior, slamming into things and hitting them as hard as possible. The new monk class turned out to be incredible. And even the classes I didn't like or care about, I eventually came around to use in some way from death knights to paladins to shamans to druids. I've played everything in my time, and took almost all of it to casual battlegrounds, waging endless, stakeless war as a nameless, faceless number in the broader superverse of World of Warcraft inter-server PvP. I call those characters faceless, alts, flippantly, but at the time, they mattered. They had to. Spending endless hours with them guaranteed it. Picking an alternate character wasn't just a fling, it was kind of like a miniature gameplay expansion. Suddenly your character behaves entirely different. Fundamentally differently than your first. Character matters. How you represent yourself in-game matters. How your experience feels and appears matters. Warps your perception of the game. With so many race choices and two sex options, you had access to a whole range of character choices and animations. I talked about them earlier, but these options expanded as expansions were released. Goblins, Worgen, Pandaren, new classes, and eventually transmogrification, allowing anyone to slap any previously acquired appearance on their gear. So your level 1 warrior could run around swinging a transmogrified gin rock, character creation, stylization, all that junk I threw myself into once I bounced off PvP and vanilla World of Warcraft was massively catered to. You could express yourself in truly myriad ways, from the clothes you wore to the mount you rode. That's part of what drew me in. WoW catered directly to my interests. But not for very long. In later expansions, 
significantly later, mind WoW began to push for visual clarity, and thus homogenized character animation, suddenly a warrior's mortal strike, which you could go years having it look a certain way, unique to your race class choice, suddenly everyone had the same mortal strike, and that animation was shared with other classes depending on what move was being used. Suddenly, World of Warcraft looked more professional. It also lost a minute yet critical piece of itself. They also touched up the appearance of every character model, something that massively, massively devalued some and enhanced others, but I think that's a conversation for the comments section. Most painful, though, for any longtime main of any particular class was the palpable ebb and flow of power and playstyle. For an entire expansion, your class may have been gifted, bespoke, unrivaled in its function, and with a simple shift of the game world, a mere two or four years, the class could change entirely. This happened multiple times, even in seemingly minute ways, like having a pair of major heals nerfed for the Restoration Shaman class and buffing other moves, fundamentally warping, shifting how they played in PvP. This was more noticeable in the later expansions as entire specializations were focused to cater to uniform class fantasies. I personally watched characters I loved become repulsive to play, like having your delicious red apple replaced with a bulbous onion. It's the kind of thing that, as an empathetic player, you can imagine the design team thinking hard about and working hard on, but as a player, makes you want to run them through with a sharpened forklift. I didn't play casual PvP exclusively, though. I may have quietly shuffled my brother out of the picture earlier, but he returned at a similar time as me, and played casually as well, and we eventually ended up queuing arenas together, something neither of us really had experience with. I have plenty of great memories, angry memories, running endless matches and grinding on that battleground. That was ideal World of Warcraft to me, just a little competitive, still fairly unprofessional, able to swap to multiple characters and compositions with someone who was great at the game. He played a mean f***ing enhancement shaman. Guy's a legend. We were never very good, never cracked gladiator or anything, and despite how frustrating rated PvP could be, it was educational and felt meaningful, like I was doing something with my time. It was goal and performance oriented, and those PvP mounts, man, like, they're the stuff of legend. Let me grind them up and drink them. Leveling characters, gearing up, screwing around. I never ran out of things to do playing WoW. It was enough. This pattern of non-committal, free boost, token abusing, multiple character leveling, battleground trawling play, I guess you could call it play, was more like melting, I think, continued up until Battle for Azeroth, partway into my YouTube career, before it was consistent and before it was my full-time job. It was the first X-Pack I got excited for, bought into, and promptly quit after the first zone. I realized that sounds insane. WoW's hooks were thoroughly lodged in my skin, and what ultimately pulled me away was a soup comprised of WoW's own resistance to my playstyle, my increasing real-life responsibilities, not to mention Miles' success on YouTube, and the announcement of Classic WoW. I'm gonna break that into chunks. WoW, for some of the years I played regular casual PvP, allowed a free range of item levels. That means in Mists of Pandaria, better equipped players, high-end raiders, long-time PvPers, could outperform newcomers and other more casual folks significantly. Not just noticeably, but to an awe-inspiring degree. I once watched a fully geared rogue ambush someone to death with one input. Obliterated. Deleted. WoW PvP was always an utterly deranged experience, and balance, at least in PvP, was an afterthought. The game was predominantly marketed to raiders, the PvEers, despite that contrary title, World of Warcraft, and so PvP historically suffered through nonsense patches with unchecked effects on battlegrounds and arenas. That's partly why I stopped engaging casually. The devs never seem to care over much about having a bad patch or needing to hotfix here or there. PvP was the nicher mode of play, and we just had to make do. And while that was an excuse on my part, leaving in the face of that, ultimately the best players in anything suck up and deal with the jank. It was plausible deniability for me. For years, maybe even today, I, I didn't check. PvP reward gear has a lower potential item level than PvE gear. It was billed as the second playstyle, the less serious, less important mode. And while Blizzard was right, I wasn't serious. Other people were. It was an obnoxious enough blow to make me question my playtime. 
As expansions were released, Blizzard eventually crunched item levels in PvP, making differences between differently geared players minimal by comparison. I liked the change. Wow, PvP suddenly functioned more like a serious competitive game, like a fighter or an FPS. The tools were mostly available out of the box, and the only buy-in was reaching level caps, something I'd long since taught myself to push through in Mists of Pandaria. That said, repeating the same pattern, expansion over expansion, for the privilege of rolling some casual PvP at level cap, eventually became vomit-inducing. You can only run the same zone so many times before going fully f***ing insane. Just trying to get a feel for a class in the new X-Pack in PvP, I wanted a casual Smash Bros. night out of WoW, and WoW wasn't folding. On top of this, my YouTube channel wasn't doing well, but things were starting to get serious. I picked up WoW again in the tail end of university, played through Teachers College, ran arena games in South Korea on my laptop with my brother, repeated the pattern all throughout starting a YouTube channel in 2016, getting a substitute teaching gig in 2017, and eventually getting minor YouTube success in 2018. There was palpable strain on my free time, especially because, for a time, I was working full-time at school, part-time after school doing daycare for money, and trying to make YouTube videos, before factoring WoW time into the equation. It wasn't a priority like it used to be. I was starting to self-actualize. I was starting to become someone. And that all came crumbling down with the announcement of WoW Classic. The monotony of modern-day WoW was driving me insane. Every x pack was the same, story dressing quality notwithstanding. Load into the new zones, take the quests, complete them, chart your way through every zone, and follow the same, or a very close route, on every alt character to maintain efficiency. Nobody wants to level except those truly ascended Zen-esque individuals who found something deeper, lacing the very soil of the world of Warcraft. As for me, I wanted to get killing, but I was constantly being handed miniature ladders, and WoW never appealed meaningfully to PvPers going forward. The few concessions, but overall disregard for PvP as a legitimate and catered to method of play, was draining every ounce of joy I had for the game, and I was not going to repeat for a fourth expansion consecutively the endless zone grinding level capping for my probably ten characters. It was a sinkhole that endlessly drew both time and money out of me. In some cases, I bought max level tokens just to avoid the misery. And that's not even considering the endless daily quests foisted on players in later expansions so you log in, fly around and do your dailies, and log out possibly never hitting a battleground because there was simply too much to do on too many alts. Leveling up your stupid artifact weapon across every single character. By the way, Final Fantasy XIV doesn't have that problem. The acclaimed MMORPG by Square Enix were born from the ashes of its original incarnation and boasting thousands of hours of gameplay in a flourishing online community catering to both hardcore and casual players alike. Doesn't have that problem. Went and put every class on your chosen character. Incredible. WoW could never. There's nothing else like WoW in terms of gaming therapy. I mean, I've never found another game I could sink time into literally burn hours away like wow but at some point even my casual engagement wasn't feasible like so many times in my life i wanted someone to freeze the clock and that's what classic wow was going to be anyway i had a long burning nostalgia for my early wow experiences and finally blizzard answered my prayers directly a chance to go back to those precious early days, a place I knew and experienced, and an opportunity to do it right this time. I wouldn't have to bury anything or carry regrets. I could finish vanilla World of Warcraft and reach level cap. In an ever unchanging world, I could avenge my warlock and my younger self. I could be the hero I wanted to be. When WoW Classic came out, I instantly dropped retail World of Warcraft and jumped into my chosen main character an undead priest. Since Mists, I'd become a full-time horde player, only rarely playing the odd night elf or worgen, and my priest from that reclamation of childhood and university became the blueprint for my very last character. I never really realized that he would be my final, officially created character in the world of Warcraft. It's a fitting race choice, I think. Friends of mine were hyped to dive back in as well, especially since I'd been hyping up Classic's release for months. All of us holding precious memories and experiences 
of our own. I couldn't possibly know. And we resolved to play WoW again, just like the old times. It was the easiest thing I'd ever done. Waiting in queue, loading into the world, my world, sinking the hours in, blazing through zones, killing rare monsters, and leveling my professions, grouping up and healing through dungeons with my friends. I knew the game, and more importantly, I knew how to thrive. I had the ability that I couldn't even imagine grasping as a teenager. It wasn't a ladder anymore. It wasn't something to grasp. I had wings all my own. On more than five separate occasions, I fought in the open world while leveling. A gnome mage, a human warrior, a dwarf hunter, a night elf rogue, a gnome warrior, and slew my foes every time. Priests are good, admittedly, with survivability, damage, and crowd control, but I felt alive, truly reborn in the world of Warcraft, at the height of my power. No longer a clicker, no longer a backpedaler, I would demolish every foe and claim every trophy. I would become a High Warlord PvP champion and conquer every raid. But there was a problem. I began to outpace my more casual friends who had very real jobs, unlike my tenuous substitute teaching gig coupled with YouTube work, and I found myself with more time than them, and a real burning hunger to play, to achieve, to make up for my early years. I had to start an alternate character or two to keep occupied while my friends were busy with their lives, and regardless of that, despite managing to get a few dungeoning nights and questing times together, it wasn't enough. I don't know if you've ever tried to arrange repeated dungeons and dragon sessions with adults over 30, but well, anyway, I blazed ahead of my friends, eager to reach that level cap. I could, I told myself, help them through dungeons regardless of my level and help them with money and things. I could become a paragon in this new world and carry them ahead. But they burned out. They fell behind. They got tired. Their hearts weren't in it like mine, weren't fully inflamed like mine. And frankly, I committed a cardinal friendship sin by breaking formation. I watched my friends pull away from World of Warcraft just the way I once did to my brother. I watched my YouTube analytics dip and felt a pang of anguish because no matter how much time I wanted to spend in WoW, I needed to feed my channel more videos if I wanted to survive in that ecosystem. And I watched in real time as my experience bar ground to a halt at 53, my motivation withering completely as I sat in the eastern plaguelands, on a hill overlooking a lake, suddenly aware that, just like before, I would never complete my playthrough of vanilla World of Warcraft. And I was so close this time. Blizzard went on to contradict my belief that the world would remain static, and instead they'd be rolling out not only WoW Classic, but the Burning Crusade Classic and Wrath of the Lich King Classic. So finally, and for the last time, fed up, beaten, and thoroughly punished by my own failings, I dropped my subscription to World of Warcraft. Since the inception of this script, months prior to the release of this video, and all the way up until the moment I published it, I wrestled with the purpose of this story. Many of these vignettes of a personal journey with World of Warcraft serve ultimately to paint fragments of my experience into a sort of shambling unflattering life. When I look back on these events, I don't see anything beautiful. I don't see what I associate with life. I see pain and fear and inadequacy. But to look at all these failings as failure alone isn't good enough. This story has lived in my mind, festering for nearly two decades. Surely, in all that growth and all of that bloom is at least a sprout of something true and meaningful. And the root is this. World of Warcraft followed me through my entire winding, confusing path to self-actualization. It was quite literally the road to my own becoming. I work hard, probably too hard, at least in terms of raw hours sunk. But I need you to understand that for most of my life, I didn't think that was even possible for me, that I would even survive working more than 40 hours a week, or that I could give anything my all. I was afraid for most of my life 
of living in discomfort. I hated doing paper delivery, understandable, and camping, strangely enough, and other things that, by all accounts, I and many children would or should be grateful for. I vanished into game worlds habitually. I was obsessed with disconnecting from reality, something I've still never really worked through. It's kind of my job. World of Warcraft was the ultimate escapist fantasy, a game that sold heroism, status, personhood, and existence in a totally virtual setting replete with endless busy work, a genuine black hole of a dream. When allowed to escape into WoW and simultaneously confronted with the need to actually perform in the game I loved so much, I stumbled at that young age and failed to capitalize on my time. I watched my brothers succeed while I floundered, and I screwed around with costumes and guilds and player killing, even toxicity, just to feel some semblance of accomplishment, joy I guess, while ignoring what I was really after. I distracted myself. I regretted it for years due to my own inability to put up with a little discomfort. I lost my closest chance playing a game I loved as thoroughly as anyone else who ever actually bothered to level cap. Lost out on raiding, never even got the chance to play in the final brackets of vanilla PvP, never got those sweet warlock sets to finally look like the hero I wanted to be. Never got an awesome mount. I robbed myself of so much and carried that guilt for years. I even ran away from my own brother when I pulled out the Burning Crusade. The entire time that made up my return to World of Warcraft was also pure escapism. A coping mechanism I taught myself young, an addiction I never even thought to address. I dodged having to confront my self-dissatisfaction during my final years of university with a return to nostalgia. I battled through strange lands with a dozen different faces through Teachers College and my year in Korea, fighting a thousand nameless battles, many defeats, and many fruitless victories. There was a moment while gathering footage for this video, I went to that arena I mentioned, the Gurabashi Arena in Stranglethorn Vale. It sounds insane, but even to that very moment, I'd never actually opened the chest before, never wanted to bother camping out or competing with others for it. After returning to WoW, I knew anything I needed to gear my PvP characters could be found in PvP, so it never occurred to me. But in that moment, I was given the chance to open it uncontested. I'm not really sure what I expected to find, and maybe the way I played the game altered what usually appears in the chest, but it hit me the second I saw nothing. This wave of mourning. There I was, standing in the very arena I dreamed of conquering, finally given what I wanted, for free. After engaging in toxic play and meaningless, time-burning battles long since forgotten, and awarded with this deep, resounding blow to my stomach, my trophy for everything my efforts amounted to. There's a glimmer of optimism lining these events. Maybe I was just playing a game, just having fun. Sometimes cruel fun, but we can forgive a child, right? Only all of these patterns repeated well into adulthood. I can't look at my journey as just play, innocent play. Not when my fear of having to finally grow up was utterly eclipsed by my computer screen. I wasted so much time. YouTube wasn't easy for me. If you've been around a while, you know I came from absolute garbage bin tier and only gotten better since. While I prepped my original terrible scripts and recorded my little playthroughs in Korea, I never bothered to teach myself my editing software or how to use a microphone or anything. Really. So even when I came back from Korea and started making little YouTube game reviews in my mom's basement, and they were terrible, it kind of destroyed me inside. Wasn't all the work I did in my free time, in a small South Korean apartment, worth anything? But that was, and is, a loser mentality. How dare I assume my work mattered to anyone? right? And it didn't get better for a long time. It festered in me while I faced my fears, striking out into my chosen academic field, feeling genuine discomfort, and never connecting how I thought I was supposed to. I mean, I taught in classrooms. I taught in high schools. 
regularly. I can't even believe it myself. Looking back, I was a child then, at 27. And I have such a distinct memory. At the end of one particular school day, fading light, filtering into the hall, thinking, I could die here. This might be how it ends. All the while, I'm going home, working on fairly terrible YouTube videos and playing World of Warcraft, daily quests, casual battlegrounds, farming cool costumes, anything I could to burn the dread away, knowing I'd eventually have to go to sleep and wake up and keep going. I think it's safe to say that it wasn't just play at that point. And it's thanks to YouTube that I managed to break my addiction. Classic WoW was a revenant, man, a specter rising from the grave to haunt me, and I bought in. I was seduced by the dream of an endless golden era, hourglass frozen still. Somewhere I could throw the fucking brakes already. And when my mastery of the game destroyed my own triumphant return, to vanilla World of Warcraft, it hit me. I'm not that person anymore. I don't belong in the World of Warcraft. At all. I barely ever did. I was a weird solo player that mostly queued with randoms for the bulk of my game time. That ephemeral journey, what I'm sharing now, was never immortalized. It's a memory. It's history and nano-history at that. But I realized, as my friends left one by one, that my little story had reached its conclusion. That person I used to be died. Despite the overwhelming luck and soul-grinding hours, I managed to make this little thing grow. In a starving YouTube ecosystem that had at one time granted me monetization, taken it away when the terms of service changed, and given it back once I ground the numbers up myself. Despite the overwhelming need for an empathetic audience to look at these shrieking things and support me, I managed to pull through. Despite having no landed successes or YouTuber friends selling my work or channel boxing me, being genuinely devoid of community like I always was, I punched up through the clouds to fight the sun itself. At least that's what it felt like, sitting alone on my couch cranking out videos like a living factory. I convinced myself that I'd finally found my purpose in life because for decades, I never felt the urge to work, improve, achieve almost anything. Just skated by on my default existence. When people tell me to take a break, and I know I should listen, it feels almost impossible. You become accustomed to the hum and drone of the factory, and at least when you're keeping it oiled and fueled, as long as it's still moving, you know it'll pick up again. Abandoning it wholesale is terrifying, but there's a genuine euphoria in what I do. I've been privileged with the ability to go to bed and not fear waking up. Hurling myself into the machinery, being torn, broken, and remolded, I became someone I wanted to be, or at least the first iteration of that person. YouTube gave me identity. YouTube gave me what I wanted from the world of Warcraft. That pain of watching my Halcyon resurrection turn to ash wasn't some deep wound in my soul. It was the swift and brutal yank of the leech stuck to my heart, a long-suffering and cynical heart. I haven't been perfectly happy ever since. I don't want to pretend like happiness is a destination. That sort of yearning will destroy a person. But contentedness with life is a very real and tangible bar that I believe anyone can potentially reach. I used to brag that I did everything on my channel, mostly alone, but it became obvious this past year that I never really did. The labor was mine, the videos were mine, but my existence on YouTube was a compromise between what I wanted to put out and what people wanted to watch. I was functionally allowed to exist. I know YouTuber is the sole author of their success. They are heralded and ratified by the mouths of those in which one's name is loosed. At my lowest point in 2022, I found myself unable to turn to the people around me for comfort, for one reason or another, and I could only look to my community, the online friends I'd made but not regularly contacted, and even my patrons on my Discord channel I started talking to frequently something I hadn't pursued since my early days in World of Warcraft. Since I started existing more broadly on this platform, 
I increasingly pulled away from contact with others, leaning on old, solitary habits, my refusal to rely on other people, my denial over needing other people. I owe a lot of personal healing and very recent healing to people I met online in this new persona, this reforged self. I don't ever want to be that other me again, so take my avatars, every name and face, and burn them all away. Carve this journey into stone and let the winds render it unreadable. Take my remains to that glistening shore and walk along the pier where ships pass and suns set and bury my heart in Booty Bay. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alpha, 42, snaps, Arch, Arswasser, Azura, Axin 8, Audra, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bosch 7, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Beguile, Bing Bing Doo Doo, Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Wargle Hargle, Boha, Boom Dead, Brandon Hesse, Brios, Brianna Wu, British Gooch, Cow, Kixar, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, C-Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Hero Hero, Cordis, Chris Bromo, CLB 5000, Cody Golden, Comfy Moogle, Couch Mobile, Crash Crashkers, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Dondium, Danny Lavelle, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Dakey Stag, Swaggy Bear, Castillo, Dara, Deco, Deadwood, Dead, Dennis Amaya, Destrega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doug Prince, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8-Bit Thunk, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Eric Monticello, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Exa, Gnar, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyphseeker, Ninecat, Goose, Six One. One, one, Gray, two. the darkest black. Garcory, Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanirga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Hermit J, Hex Max, Honey Mutt, Horn Tiger, How do you know? Huey, I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Clown, I punched a sandwich, Irrational, Irradiated Cherries, Dice Kyle, It's not bad, It's time to sue, It's not good, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jacob, James, Jason Lasky, Jaden, Jay Dayas, JK Hedgehog, John Bo the Joker, Joke Frog, Jordan Joyner, Jules, DLC, Julian my Julian. Kai's at a slow. K-Bash's best K? Keegan too cool. Kata Snap. King Kuma. Keej. Can I pipe? Quark. K Noe. Cone 2020. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Kais. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalia. Lady Weed. Latrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Little Big Trouble. Loathsome Dung Eater. Warren. Low Fat Mogul. Lucas Boyd. Lucky McSmucky. Mac James. Loopin' the Turd. Magic Meow. Magical Mad Man. Mama Rollin'. Manapool. Mara Ganger. Mercules. Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Meeple. Puppet. Metal Gear Gash. Michelle Satrano. Mike DeVille. Milky Mo Official. Mikusagi. Moa. Bobby Dobby. Big Titty Goff. GF Cooley. Monochrome only. Morgana Black. Modi. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dab Face McYoink Bomb. Nyra New. Vito Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rat. Nuri and Daridius. Not Nobel. Nuggy. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Omega Fighter. Omni Nerd Zero. Only LK. The Plant. Pandemic Cowboy. Pinata. PBK. PK Gaming. Pontus Redding. Popular Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Fractal and Pals. Project Dark Light. Quasar McDougal. Quillworth. Quinn. Rad Punk. Reasonable Willow. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Friend Relay. Roy Londo. RP Gamer. Ryan Mori Brooks. Siren Smells Good. Salsa. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. Say Say. Sakai No Award. Sexy Bionicle GF. Shy. Shinigami. Shintendo. Shut Up Wesley. Silver Bear 909. Sin. Sir Doodles A Lot. Sim. God! Sleepy Wabbit. Slick Tactics. Snart. Sock em Bopper. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Standard Issue Dingus. Star Night Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Streetums. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Guy. Harvold's Quest. Sean Chubbington. Terrence Swift. The Big Buddy. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah! The Green Loki. The Legendary Zoltan. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Real McCoy. The Dick Mystic. Fresh. Rips Heart. Tickles McGuffin. Tim Lobster. Tim the Rider. Turtle Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chungus. Vig. Vacant Plaza. Valen Rift. Venom. Vice Pop. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Wayland. Where am I? Help? Widgie. Winter Solstice. Wind TV. Wrenchim. Zanny Tanner. Yashi Chi. Yay Kundo. Your mom. Winky Face. Zachary Lives. Zachary Z. Zanasa. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Zalazar. Sylvan Ray. Z-Nova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.